True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is episode 32, The Vartekleur 4. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon subscribers, Michael Carling and Ruth. Thank you so much for your support, Michael and Ruth. It really is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. Other ways to support the show and help it grow include sharing episodes on your social media platforms and inviting your friends and family to listen. Today's case addresses quite a few pertinent issues. It involves four offenders who were minors at the time of the incident, and it involves a victim who, to this day, remains unidentified. It is the story of four boys who kept a deadly secret, and one who could no longer keep that secret. When the case hit the headlines in South Africa in 2003, it became an obsession for many. Far from being another murder trial, it became representative of the fight for justice when privilege and status seeks to trump what is right. I've been asked before if I think it's fair to talk about solved cases when the perpetrator has served their time and been released. I've been asked if I don't think it's a bit unfair to dredge up the past And doesn't everyone deserve a second chance? Well, yes. Absolutely, some offenders do deserve a second chance, if they've been rehabilitated. And if an offender has served their time, then I don't deny them the right to try and make what they can of their life. But that right will never be more important than the victim's right to have a voice. The victim doesn't get a second chance, but they do get to have their story told. And if that makes an offender uncomfortable, that's unfortunate. But it's not going to stop me from talking about what their victim went through. The victim in this case is completely faceless and nameless. But today, he will not be voiceless. Let's get into episode 32. The Vatikler 4. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Vatikler is a suburb of Pretoria, South Africa. It's located to the east of the city centre, and it's a highly sought-after area with expensive real estate and high-profile residents. The area is home to one of the most prestigious public high schools in the province, Vatikloor Voor School. The high school is an Afrikaans medium school, and it's one of the most expensive public schools in South Africa. In exchange, the school offers students impeccable academics, and a wide array of excellent extracurricular activities. The students, who call themselves Kloofies, are encouraged to participate as members of their community from a young age. And it is this sense of ethics that seems to have been one of the sparks in events that would follow. In 2001, the principal of Vatikloof Hoorde School was Dr. Christo Becker. Dr. Becker is known for playing a large role in turning the school into the prestigious establishment it is today. But at the time, it's alleged that Dr. Becker did have a small problem, and that was his rather unruly 16-year-old son, Christoph. Christoph Becker was a rather large personality. He hoped to be an actor one day, and according to a local magazine, was not averse to getting into trouble. It's unclear whether Christoph ever attended Hoerskool Vatikloof, 
where his father was principal. But his records show that he predominantly attended another local prestigious Afrikaans school, Hoer School Gasfontein. Whether this was intentionally done to avoid having the boy under his own father's discipline is unknown, but I can imagine that it would be rather uncomfortable for a well-respected principal to have his own son running amok in his school. As part of this sense of community that I mentioned, both Hoerskool Waterkloof and Hoerskool Gasfontein were visited by members of the SAPS during the course of 2001. The reason the SAPS were at the school was because there'd been a spate of house burglaries in the area in the prior weeks, and they wanted to ask students to keep an eye open and report any strange activities to their local police station. The intent around this action was pure. But for four boys listening to this plea, it seems that the mission became a little skewed in their minds. Christoph Becker was friends with several other boys. Among them was 16-year-old Fricky de Prier, whose father was a doctor and whose mother worked as a teacher at Hoerskool Waterkloof. 16-year-old Gert van Skalkwijk was also another member of the group of friends. He was a tall, well-built child who dreamed of becoming a rugby player. A younger member of the group was Reinach Tiet, who was 15 years old and the most academically gifted of the friends. Reinach was also quieter and more subdued than the others. A pair of brothers, Heinrich and Reinhard von Landsberg, also often hung around with the group of boys, and some sources have stated that the boys were cousins of one of the other boys. By all accounts, this group of boys was no different from any other in their age group at this point. They were enjoying high school, embracing the bright futures that lay ahead of them, and in between, they included a smattering of parties, one of which would lead to their eventual downfall. On the 2nd of December 2001, the group of boys I named earlier, and one additional young man who was never named, all went out to a club in Hatfield. The boys were drinking, and although one or more may have had a learner's license, none of these boys could have legally driven a car on their own, so the two vehicles they were driving that night, a BMW and a Toyota Taz, were both being driven by unlicensed teenagers under the influence of alcohol. I'm sure that when this tale emerged, many people wanted to blame the parents and ask why they allowed this. I'm pretty sure, though, that they were not aware that this was happening. I think we all know that as teenagers, it wasn't that difficult to tell your parents that you were at someone's house when you were actually somewhere else altogether. While drinking and driving was certainly dangerous enough, this would not be the worst of the night's events. The accounts of the events that followed the group of boys leaving the nightclub in Hatfield differ slightly, so I will give you the general version of events and deal with the discrepancies later. It is alleged that after leaving the nightclub, the BMW containing Becker, Van Skalkveik, Duprier and Tiet slowed down outside a gym in Constantia Park after identifying a man loitering who they believed to be up to no good. Without provocation, the four boys allegedly severely assaulted the man. They then got back into their vehicle and continued on. When they reached the Moraletta Park area, they came across another man. Again, the boys parked their vehicle and, according to witness testimony, retrieved two knives and a hammer from the boots of the BMW. The Taz, which had driven ahead, was called back to the scene with the two von Landsberg boys and the unidentified boy. 
it's alleged that Christoph Becker walked up to the man on the side of the road and asked him if he knew where Blut Street was. For our overseas listeners, Blut means blood in Afrikaans. And although there is indeed a street by that name in the area they were in, it's entirely possible that Becker was simply trying to be clever in this question, as without waiting for the man to answer, he allegedly punched him twice in the face. The man attempted to flee and ran into a nearby park. He was chased by the group of boys. The image is reminiscent of a pack of dogs hunting their prey. Although dogs only hunt for survival and not for entertainment. Gerd van Skalkwijk put his rugby skills to use by tackling the man off his feet, while Reinach Tiet kicked and punched him. And it's alleged that Christoph stabbed the man. When their victim lay bleeding and begged them to call an ambulance, Fricky de Prier asked him if he knew who Nas Boerter was, and then he kicked his head as though it were a rugby ball. Christoph allegedly discarded the knives in the park, and Reinach took the hammer which he had used on the man home with him where he cleaned it. The boys left the scene, and their victim, to die. One of the von Landsberg boys would later allege that Christoph had instructed him to return to the park the next day to find the knives, and while he'd been unable to retrieve them, he did come across the dead body of the man he alleges they assaulted the previous night. He said that he called Christoph from the scene to ask him what he should do, and he'd been told to make sure the man was dead, and then carry on looking for the knives. The boy says that he had thrown a stone at the man's body from a distance, and when there was no movement in reaction, he left the scene. He would return again later that day, again allegedly on Christoph's insistence. But when he saw that police had cordoned off the area, he left. The body of the man found in the park that day would never be identified. A post-mortem was conducted on his body, and then, as investigators were unable to determine the man's identity, he was buried in an unmarked municipal burial site. And this would have been the end of the story, if it hadn't been for one conscience, as most of the boys involved simply went on with their lives. Except one couldn't. One of the von Landsberg boys had started struggling emotionally very soon after this incident. His parents were in the process of getting divorced, and they assumed that this was the reason, and in 2003, he was sent to a school counsellor. As they discussed the various reasons for his marks dropping and his negative behaviour, the boy suddenly made a confession. Eighteen months before, he had been with a group of boys when they had participated in a brutal assault. He was aware that the assault had ended with the man dying. It was this, and not his parents' divorce, that had been weighing on his mind. Naturally shocked at this unexpected confession, the boy's parents were called in, and soon he named each of the other boys that had been involved. One of them was Christoph Becker, the son of the school principal, Dr. Christo Becker. According to the documentary, Heis Genoet Varde Levensdramas, the parents discussed what steps should be taken next, and it's alleged that some of the parents had wanted to let the matter be left as it was. Some thought that nothing had come of it, so why poke the hornet's nest? Hein von Landsberg, though, the father of the boy who had confessed, could not accept this. Although both of his sons had been involved in the assault and eventual murder, he decided to make contact with the National Directorate of Public Prosecutions to hand over the information. Hein said that he was trying to raise his children to know right from wrong, 
and if he took the easy way out in such a difficult situation, he would be teaching them that there are no consequences for your actions. Despite being very unpopular among the other parents, Hein spoke to Jan de Oliveira of the NDPP, who ordered a full investigation. At this point, most of the boys had already matriculated and were starting to study. Reinach Titz had received a bursary to study in America, and he was no longer in the country. Christoph Becker had started at a local acting school, and the other boys were all fully involved in their post-school lives. On receiving the information about the case from the NDPP, the police were in a bit of a quandary. Essentially, what they had was a confession to a murder, but they had no idea whose murder, or whether the case was even being investigated as a murder. So the first step was to figure out which case they were talking about. Going back 18 months, they started to wade through the reports relating to bodies that had been found around that time. Sure enough, they found a report relating to the body of an unidentified male found in a park on the 3rd of December 2001. It was very interesting to me to find out about the involvement of the three other boys. Because, of course, this case is always focused on the Vartekloof 4. Well, actually, that was the Vartekloof 7. Some just got off easier than others. The two von Landsberg boys, as well as the third boy who was not named, received immunity from prosecution in exchange for their testimony, as it was this testimony that almost the entire case would hinge upon. In August 2003, warrants of arrest were issued for the four boys, now men, who would become known as the Vartekloof Four. Christoph Becker, Gert van Skalkveik and Fricky de Pria were all taken into custody and Reinach Tiet was advised that he needed to return to South Africa immediately, which he did. On his return, he too was arrested. It was at this time that South Africa was introduced to the four young men who would fill headlines for years to come. And it was also at this time that a very specific narrative started around this case. The young men were all good-looking, well-educated and relatively well-off. And the media went crazy. Christoph Becker was almost immediately cast as the ringleader, his seemingly carefree attitude around such a serious situation was deemed arrogance, and he didn't seem to think that he was at any risk of serving any jail time at all. Fricky Dupria was not very different, and in many posed photos taken of the four together outside the courthouse, Fricky and Christoph seemed to be the most comfortable having their photo taken, often smiling while Gert van Skalkveik and Reinach Tiet seem to be slightly less excited to be the centre of this negative attention. The boys wore expensive suits and were always impeccably groomed. They also displayed a really united front, and it was at this point that they made a vital mistake. They chose to all be represented by the same council. So instead of having four separate attorneys who could fight for their freedom, they were all lumped into one group. If one was going to be found guilty, they were all going to be found guilty. In their initial questioning and statements, the four did not deny that they had assaulted a man on the night of the 2nd of December 2001. They described a brutal attack in Moraleta Park, on a man that they claimed had been fleeing from a house with a stolen television. They admitted to having used the weapons that the witness had described, but there were two major differences in their statements. They all denied that they had ever assaulted anyone in Constantia Park, which was the first assault outside the gym that the witness had described. They also denied that the man they had assaulted had died, to their knowledge, 
essentially the crux of their defense, would be that although they accepted their assault could have led to the death of the person they'd assaulted, there was no proof that the body the police were saying was their victim was actually the man they assaulted. The four were offered a plea deal. If they pleaded guilty to assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm, they would be offered a far shorter sentence. Remember that they were minors when the crime was committed, so they would have been sentenced as such. They refused to take the plea, and instead, they were charged with murder and serious assault. In their initial appearance, it was alleged that the four had been threatening witnesses, and one of the parents was asked to leave the court after making threatening gestures to a witness. The prosecutor would also later state that he'd been followed by a vehicle filled with young men for 15 kilometres, and that he'd been approached by an anonymous person with a bribe to lose the docket. They all pleaded not guilty to both charges and were granted bail of 10,000 rand each. The trial of the Vartekloor 4 started on the 4th of July 2004 and the media would report that the behaviour of the accused had not improved much. Words like arrogance and privilege were bandied about, but still, most of the coverage focused on what the boys were wearing day to day what their hairstyles looked like, and how they seemed totally unconcerned about what was happening around them. Hayskanuit spoke of an incident where Christoph Becker was told off by the magistrate for behaving inappropriately in court, and told that this was a serious situation he was in. He apparently looked around him, and then back at the magistrate and asked, Are you talking to me? The state needed to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the body found in the park was the same man that the group had admitted to assaulting. The defence adamantly denied that the first assault described had ever taken place, and when the witness testified, his testimony around this event was sketchy and inconsistent in places. The state explained that there was alcohol involved on the night in question, and they did admit that it was possible that the first assault had actually taken place on a different night. This only served to further portray the accused men as young thugs who spent their spare time driving around, beating up people for no good reason. The information printed in the media with regard to the victim painted him as a homeless man. In discussing the autopsy, the media would state that because the pathologist did not have any information about the case at the time, it would have been difficult for her to know what to look for in terms of injuries, and that's pretty much all that was said in the media at least about the victim. Unfortunately, the state could not locate the body of the victim to attempt a second autopsy, as municipal graves were unmarked. Please keep that in mind, because it will be important later. The state's case rested on the testimony of the witnesses and cell phone activity, which put the accused men in the Moraletta Park area at the time that the witnesses said the assault had occurred. The accused men had also, of course, admitted to assaulting a man in the same area that night. What the state had to prove, though, was that the dead man found in the park was definitely the same man that the group had attacked that night. Honestly, it sounds really improbable, to me at least, that such a coincidence would occur where a man was beaten in a specific area, but magically disappeared, and then another separate man appeared dead in the same park but it had absolutely nothing to do with the Vartikler 4. That sounds absolutely ludicrous, doesn't it? Well, the judge agreed, and a year after their trial started, and almost four years after the assault and murder, the judge handed down his decision, in which he stated that he believed the testimony of the witnesses 
over the testimony of the accused. He explained that he felt any inconsistencies in the witness testimony could be explained by the trauma of the event, as well as alcohol intoxication. The judge also found that it was inconceivable that the man the group had admitted to beating had just stood up and walked away and was never heard from again, and then a different man had been found dead in the same park in which they committed their assault. In his judgment, he called Becker a self-confessed liar of astounding arrogance. The Vartikloor four were found guilty of the murder of the unidentified man. Suddenly, the situation became very grave for the four men, who'd previously believed that there was no way they were going to be found guilty. The united front they'd shown, and their performances for the media, were a thing of the past. As they entered into the pre-sentencing phase, it was every man for himself. The group blamed the media for the impression that the court had developed of them, saying that they had driven a narrative that they were little rich boys who had decided that the life of a homeless man was worth nothing. The pre-sentencing hearing lasted from the 20th of November 2006 until January 2007, when their sentence was passed down. Each one of the group was given a sentence of 12 years. Although the public was outraged by the perceived leniency of the sentence, it is understandable, as they were sentenced as minors, and the judge did take into account that alcohol was involved, and the group mentality would have made individuals do things that they would otherwise not usually do. Counsel for the four men immediately lodged an appeal, which was allowed by the presiding judge, and they would spend only half an hour in jail before being released on bail to await their appeal. The Vartikloor four would go on to attempt two appeals. The first, in April of 2008, to the High Court, was denied. During these appeals, Christoph Becker decided to take his own attorney, and requested a new trial, stating that his previous attorney had not had his best interests in mind. Despite this, their second appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeals was also turned down. In August 2008, the four men reported to the Pretoria Central Prison to begin serving their sentence. The duration of the trial had taken a huge toll, both financially and emotionally, on the families of the four men. Pretoria Central Prison offers more perks to prisoners than many other prisons, as there are more opportunities for visiting and inmates are allowed more privileges. Despite this, a few months after starting their sentences, Reinach Tiet and Gerd van Skalkwijk both applied to be moved to Zornewater Prison in Cullinan. The reason for this was that the latter facility offered a lot more in terms of outdoor activities due to its setting. Tiet had been working as a personal trainer and Van Skalkwijk still harboured his love for rugby. So when they were transferred, they put these skills to practice in Zonavata and passed their time in a more constructive fashion. It seemed fitting that Christoph Becker and Fricky Dupria would stay in the same facility together, as the two had always seemed to be on the same page, and closer than the others. Dupria Tiet and Van Skalkwijk all studied and earned degrees while in prison. In December 2011, Tiet and Van Skalkwijk had the remainder of their sentences converted to correctional supervision by a parole board at Zornavata Prison, and they were released on parole. Their jubilation at being set free would be short-lived, though, as correctional services appealed the decision and eight months after being released, the two men were incarcerated again to serve out the remainder of their sentences. On the 11th of February 2014, all four men were released on parole. They were met by hordes of reporters, 
and Becca and Dupria waltz out of prison dressed in high fashion gear with attractive young women on their arms. Their friends stood outside the prison with a banner saying, Welcome home, Fricky and Christoph. Come sit, we'll make tea. On the banner was a picture of the group from the movie The Hangover. If you haven't seen the movie, it's about a group of friends who go out on one last night of partying before one of the men gets married. Their drunken revelry turns into a night of craziness. They don't ever beat a homeless man to death, though. And although some might think the reference is funny, I think it's in very poor taste and just continues to show the minimization of their actions. This attitude would be reinforced five days after the group were released when an anonymous source sent a video to officials at Pretoria Central Prison. The video showed Dupria and Becker drinking alcohol and partying inside their cell about two weeks before their release. In the video, the two men and a third unidentified man drink brandy out of coffee mugs. Becker has a computer inside his cell with an LCD screen, and he's playing music. The men dance, laugh, and make jokes about their experiences in prison, while only wearing shorts. Becker preens for the camera constantly, flexing his muscles and shaking his hips. If you didn't know that it was a prison cell, and one of the partygoers wasn't sitting on a toilet instead of a chair, you would think it was just another get-together in a young man's bedroom. The party, of course, contravened many prison regulations, and as such, Dupria and Becker were immediately re-arrested and taken back to prison. They would eventually both be released in December 2014, and this would be their last stretch in prison for this crime. The young men seemingly did their best to reignite their dreams and build lives for themselves. Their experiences post-prison seemed in stark contrast to many other offenders, though. While people leaving prison for a crime as serious as murder would usually struggle to find a job, Dupria, von Skalkveik and Tiet all pretty much walked into positions after their release without any practical experience on the basis of their degrees. Tit, for instance, was managing a team of 20 people in his first post-release position, according to Heisgenoot. Becker moved to Cape Town and continues to pursue his dream of acting. The victim remained nameless and faceless and in an unmarked grave. The journalist who covered this case for Heisgenoot says that she believes that the four are still convinced, to this day, that their actions did not result in the death of anyone, and that they are not guilty of murder. It didn't take much for this case to gain racial overtones. I guess it was always going to happen. The four perpetrators were well-off white boys, and the victim was an indigent black man. Indeed, it was alleged at times that the attacks were completely racially motivated. I think it would be naive to think that race did not play a factor in this crime, but I do think that it would be far too simplistic to say that the entire motive behind the crime was due to the colour of the victim's skin. I also think that lets the perpetrators off far too easily. Unprovoked violence of this nature runs far deeper than hatred based on race. I think it has a lot to do with power, too. With so many perpetrators, it's safe to say that the motives for their actions were not all the same. Christoph Becker presented as a leader of sorts within the group. In all the incidents, it's alleged that he acted first and the others followed. He, in my opinion, seemed to find the attacks rather entertaining. As a whole, if any of these boys were really worried about the safety and security of their neighbourhood, all they had to do was restrain the man that they believed to be a thief and call the police. The brutal attack 
was not only completely unnecessary, but spoke to a pack mentality. The other role players, despite some of them seeming to better understand the severity of their actions, all played a role in the attack. I think it's safe to assume that many of the others had different motives, perhaps including proving their prowess among their friends. With all of the media hype and attention to this case, it's easy to forget that there's a victim involved here, especially since that victim is unidentified. Usually we'll have at least a victim's family sitting in a courtroom as a voice for the victim. But in this case, we don't even have that. The man who died in that park has a family somewhere, who to this day wonder where he went and why he never came home. He may have had children, who might grow up thinking that their father didn't love them enough to be in their lives, and that simply is not the case. The victim here doesn't even get a final resting place with his name on it, like so many other unidentified victims in our country. He was buried in a state grave to make space in the mortuary for the next man, woman or child. This would ordinarily be where I would wrap up with the summation of the evidence and the theories around the case. But just when I was getting ready to release this episode, something happened that I haven't had to deal with before. I was doing a Google search for some images, and for some reason the images tab in Google is a hiding place for some really interesting stuff. And I came across a scanned copy of the pathologist's report relating to the victim in this case. Now, I will tell you, that is not normal to begin with. Those reports are confidential, and you have to apply to get them, and give very good reasons for wanting them. Autopsy reports do not just float around on Google. So, of course, I went into the link, and eventually found myself on two different websites, both of which presented evidence about the Vatikloor 4 case that I have never seen before, and hadn't seen while I was researching this episode. The evidence demanded another look at this case, this time from a different angle. It seems, and I withhold final judgment on whether that's really the case, but it seems we were presented with a very select number of points by the media, which fed into a very specific narrative. And the cold, hard facts of the case actually open up to a whole different can of worms. This is a victim-focused podcast. But in my mind, you cannot accurately be a voice for the victim if you're working off half the facts. So really, on behalf of the victim, it is my responsibility to tell the other side of the story, and then let you decide for yourself what you believe. There is no justice for a victim if the correct offender is not apprehended for their crime. So literally hours before you expected this episode to drop into your feed, I had to make a decision. Release it with half the facts, and close my eyes and pretend I didn't see what I saw, or commit to covering that additional information in a future episode. You helped me decide by voting on the poll on the Facebook group, and so this episode will be part one of the Vatikloor 4 case, with part two following as soon as I've made head or tail of the mass of information I found. So the basis of the Vatikloor IV's defence has always been that the deceased man in the park was not the same man they assaulted. As I've said, that sounds absolutely ludicrous, right? It's impossible, isn't it? Or is it? Thank you for listening to episode 32, part 1, The Vatikloor 4. If you enjoyed this episode, please
please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'll be back next Friday with part two of the Vartikleur 4. Until then, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>